Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria, and I got my Danax, or should we call it Great Axe? Either will do, we know what we're talking about here. So this, um, this journey started um, a few months ago where um, I started looking again at the uh, famous Hauskarls or Huskarls um, as depicted on the Bayer tapestry. And um, I have always been intrigued by these axemen shown on, on the Bayer tapestry and um, the history of them. And of course, we know that axes were associated with um, the Scandinavian raiders that attacked Britain and other places in the 8th and 9th and 10th and 11th centuries. And um, we don't know exactly um, how many of them carried axes. We don't know whether these large two-handed axes were um, typical or very widespread. But what we do know for absolute certain is that a type of very large broad axe as shown here um, became popular in um, parts of Scandinavia and indeed in England um, by the 11th century, um, such that um, we see these people on the Bayer tapestry, they stand out from the typical people, the typical Anglo-Saxons using shields and spears, and the typical Normans, a lot of the Normans fighting on horseback, obviously being the nature of the Bayer tapestry, they tend to show the knights or the, the, the Norman uh, cavalry, um, but there were in fact obviously infantry as well, we see archers for example. But um, for me, these figures wielding these big two-handed axes on the bare tapestry always stood out as especially sort of heroic and awesome and formidable. And I always wanted one of these axes. And when I started researching these, and when I started looking at the original examples in the Museum of London, um, I started realising that these are not... Um, as massive unwieldy weapons as some people might assume them to be um, by vir virtue of the fact that they're actually very very thin and when I started looking at, at these examples um, the, in England the most famous examples we have are um, a set of examples from the Museum of London um, and there's also uh, at least one example in the British Museum as well. The British Museum one is the biggest, uh, I believe, in the United Kingdom. It's one of the biggest recorded in the world in terms of both the weight and the length of the edge. The length of the edge, okay? Um, but we find that they come in different proportions. Some have different lengths of blade here. Some have a different width of the edge here. We see different types of sockets. And we don't know that much about the length of the shafts, but one thing that we can say, thanks to the Bayer Tapestry and a few other um, nice bits of artwork, is they are some sh sometimes shown like this, being lent on, which of course gives us a good um, analogue for how long some of them might have been. It's not to say all of them were that long. Certainly the evidence actually points to the fact that quite a lot of them were shorter than this, but I decided to go with the longest justifiable shaft. Um, I understand that in some reenactment circles, some of these axes have been put on very long, almost kind of like bill or halberd length shafts. Um, but according to the Bayer tapestry, this seems to be about right, about, about the height that you'd lean your um, elbow on if you were standing around chatting. And in fact, this is very interesting because this corresponds roughly to the uh, size of a lot of two-handed swords from the 16th century, large long swords and uh, getting into what some people would term um, zweihanders or montante or spadone, things like this. And yes, indeed, some of those are six foot long, uh, but it does seem that a lot of them um, come under the arm kind of height, um, which might correspond to what Filippo Vardi talks about in his treatise, but that's going off in a different um, tangent. Back to the axes. So, um, I uh, initially, as many of you will know, did a video where I talked about the fact that I would really love to procure an authentically uh, constructed, or at least uh, authentically formed, that is the weight and statistics, um, copy of one of these. And various people stepped up, um, and for all I know, there might be some other people out there still working on these, but one person in particular, Tord Berglin of Thor's Forge, uh, link of course below to his Facebook page, um, stepped up and basically said, Matt, I'll make you one, I've been wanting to make one of these, and um, uh, I'd be happy to do it for you, which I was I extremely uh, grateful for, and I gave him all the stats that I could, and pictures and and other things, and, uh, and he went away and worked on it, and he had a lot of data of his own. Um, 
And this is not a video talking in depth. I'm going to do a separate video talking in depth about the construction of these and the stats of these. Why am I saying these? Well, because I was very lucky <laughs> to be able to procure not one, but two. And they're both from um, Tord. If I just bring this... Um, protector sheath off. Um, the one in my right hand is made with modern steels and the one in this hand is made with old and traditionally formed steels. I will talk more about that in the other video but they are pretty much, they're not precisely the same, but they're pretty much the same size and weight. In fact, the one made of modern steel is very slightly heavier, um, but um, they're pretty, they're on the same length shafts pretty much. In fact, the modern steel one's about a centimetre longer, um, but they're about the same size, about the same weight. And um, he initially made this one as a prototype for this one, and this one he gave to me. So I have to say, like massive thanks to Tord, um, but um, partly in thanks and partly because I wanted another one, I bought this one. So he was going to sell this one and I just got in there first. Sorry guys, but if you want an axe like this, by all means contact Thor's Forge and talk to Todd about it because I'm sure he's, he's happy to make more of these, okay? And they are fantastic things. Um, I'm just gonna carefully, they're both very sharp, so I'm very gonna carefully balance that back up against the ball, right. Um, so what, um, what we're gonna look at here is a little bit of my initial movement stuff with the ax. Um, now, I should hasten to add that whilst I have some pole arm experience, I've done some quarter staff stuff, some spear stuff, um, some pole axe stuff and some bayonet stuff. So those are my primary, um, my primary experience bases for the use of pole weapons. And those are based on historical sources. So obviously the bayonet stuff is based on bayonet manuals. Um, the uh, halberd and pole axe stuff is based on um, medieval and renaissance treatises. And the spear stuff is based on a mixture of um, historical treatises, principally Fiore, a little bit of Bolognese, um, but also um, informed by using it quite a bit in sparring. What I have not used is a Danax, so I am not a Danax expert, expert <laughs> uh, by any means, um, but what I'm aiming to do here is to start to experiment with, based on my experience of using pole weapons and swords, long swords as well, and two-handed swords, um, kind of experiment with how I think plausibly these Danaxes may have been used. Now I fully accept there's lots of things um, that we, there's lots of bits of the jigsaw that we don't necessarily have the missing parts of context being basically that. Were these just battlefield weapons that were used in a specific part of the formation? Were they used on the flanks? Were they used principally against horses? Were they used to disrupt enemy shield walls? We don't know this, okay? Um, and lots of people have lots of different theories. I'm not going to go into that conjecture right here, right now. Um, but what I am going to look at is using this in single combat, how might this weapon move? Where is its point of balance? What's its size? Um, how does it heft? How does it feel? How does it move? Now, there are a few things I instantly noticed when I started practicing with this in my garden, as you can see here. First of all, there's various ways you can hold the weapon. You can move the handle, uh, the hands rather, up and down the shaft. Um, you can use the butt, um, which as you know, I love. Um, you can use the butt end or you can use the head end. That's pretty typical of any pole weapon, okay? So you can, you can essentially use it like a quarter staff. You can use it with a kind of snap cut. Um, you can put the hands together, you can have them far apart, you can slide the hand down as you deliver a cut, so that is you could start with the hands far apart and then slide them together as you perform the cut. Um, there were a few things I noticed about the weapon. First of all, it is it inevitably, although it's relatively light for its size, this blade is um, really um, thin. Um, very thin up here, so it's about as light as you can possibly make a functional axe blade with this length edge um, without making it much, you know, obviously it's as light as you can make it for that size. You could of course make a heavier one, um, but it is nevertheless very, very tip heavy. And not only that, but based on my practice with pole axes, I had noticed 
Um, I had trained things in the past with weapons which had something on the back to balance out the axe blade, so a hammer, a spike, this type of thing. And I instantly noticed, of course, that when you don't have that, it very much the edge aligns itself. So edge alignment, not really a problem. And that's assisted by the fact that um, Tord, as I asked for, has fitted this with an oval shaft, so it's thinner that way than that way. Fantastic, as all axes should be, in my opinion. Um, and that corresponds to the almost teardrop shaped um, socket at the end here. Um, so that aids edge alignment, the fact you can feel in your hand, you can index the weapon. But the fact that the weapon is so monodirectional, you have such an extended blade pointing in only one direction, it does mean that it naturally will align itself anyway. You can feel if it's pointing in the wrong direction. Um, but uh, when I went to hit with the back end, for example, I found uh, that very, very inconvenient. Why would you hit with the back end? Well, I, this is just experimentation. I'm not saying that anyone ever did this deliberately. But based on the use of pole axes, I wanted to hit with the hammer end, with the pole end, um, and I found I couldn't really do it conveniently with this axe because it was not balanced and it wanted to, the blade, the, the edge essentially, wanted to come back to front. Okay, um, so that was interesting to me. I experimented a little bit with using the butt and the head in conjunction, so striking with the butt and then immediately following up with the head, maybe clearing a shield out of the way and then following through with the head. This is something that I think Plausibly, if you were using this in single combat, someone may well have done, may well have used the Q, as we see in Polax techniques, use the back end to do something, whether it's a thrust, a poke, um, or whether it's pulling, levering something out of the way to enable a, a blow through with the, with the axe blade. Um, inevitably also you could give some degree of thrust with these because that is pretty damn pointy and whilst it's not in line with the shaft, it is nevertheless still pointing forward. That is super sharp. And if you jammed that into someone's face, they're not going to be happy about it, to put it mildly. So um, you could thrust with this. You can strike with both ends of the shaft. You could definitely hook with the bottom end of here. Uh, lots of people, I'm not the first person by any means to say this, but lots of people have pointed out that you could use the axe for pulling the top or edge or bottom of a shield aside or out of the way, especially with boss grip shields. It means that there you don't have a good amount of leverage on a boss grip shield. So absolutely you could push uh, one side of the person's boss grip and it would push the shield open, but you could pull it open as well. And of course, having pulled, you could then immediately jab in with the point as well. So there we go. Um, just some initial thoughts. It is a joyous weapon to move around. There are some parallels and some similarities with a large two-handed greatsword, but they're not that similar. The greatsword is balanced towards the hands. This weapon is balanced um, towards the head, so it does handle more like a typical polearm, but it's not as long as some polearms, which in some cases makes it a bit more maneuverable. Certainly in a tight press, you could move around in all directions and keep it moving. As you um, will see in the motion video, I did um, experiment with keeping my hands towards the end and swinging it which is shown in the Bayer Tapestry. Now it's possible that this has a longer shaft than the ones in the Bayer Tapestry historically had. Um, I don't know, um, but I found that keeping the hands together made the weapon incredibly unwieldy. Made it for a very powerful swing, but it was a kind of um, all or nothing technique. So if a horse was charging towards you and you held the weapon with both hands right at the end and swung it, you'd have a huge amount of reach, huge amount of leverage and speed at the tip, um, but it, there'd be no going back that you've got one swing and then it's quite difficult to recover after that. And it'd probably bury itself in the ground if you missed. <laughs> and possibly even if it went through a horse's neck, it would still bury itself in the ground afterwards. A hugely beautiful and powerful weapon that very clearly was very important to the rulers of Anglo-Saxon England and before them, also to the to various groups of Vikings who were raiding um, Britain and, and Danish rulers who conquered Britain in the 11th century, Canute for example. Um, but also we know that these were carried by the Varangian Guard in the Byzantine Empire. These were weapons that obviously um, were very specialised and filled people with awe and wonder at the time. And they are a magnificent thing and I have to once again heartfelt thanks to Tord of Thor's Forge, link below, 
check out his stuff. He has absolutely nailed it. He's made exactly what I was looking for and I'm extremely happy with it. And I'm looking forward to putting both of these axes through their paces, doing some more swinging around. And yeah, I will be doing a video talking more about how these were made um, and a little bit more detail. And also I'll be doing a video where at least using the modern steel one, I'm going to chop some stuff up at some point. I'm hoping to procure some pig heads and let's we'll see what uh, this does to those. I imagine it makes fairly short work of them. Um, but we'll think of some different types of tests that we can maybe do with this. I also hope that I have demonstrated in my motion, uh, cap, my motion video um, that these can be relatively nimble. And don't only think about these as giving great big swings, you can do snap cuts. Think about the equivalent of a, uh, of a jab. Has a huge amount of power when you have a blade that's this long, this thin, this sharp, with this amount of mass in it. You can still do lots of different types of attacks. It's not only about giving big swings, but think about the body mechanics involved in giving a good fast cut with a long sword or a little jab even with a sabre. Think about uh, using your hips and your footwork and your shoulders and the way you twist and you can apply a huge amount of force into this with relatively minimal movement. Um, hope this has been interesting and um, we will see these axes in future videos lots and thanks again Thor's Forge hurrah cheers folks thanks for watching please subscribe we have extra videos on patreon and you can follow us on Facebook